Oh, w w what is this? It's the principled BSDF. But if you were to hide this, this is what the node looks like. And in this video, I'm going to tell you what every single slider does. For this scene, I basically have this ottoman that I scanned. This is the HDR I am using. This video is sponsored by uh, Squarespace. We're going to talk about that later, but BSDF time. So starting off with base color, this is kind of the most obvious. You take it, you change the color. This is what it does. On a more technical level, it changes colors of diffuse, of transmission, I think of some surface. We're going to go to specular, which is a fancy word for reflection. So the first thing in specular, you're going to see this IOR level. You set it to zero. You can see we get rid of those reflections on the edges, whereas here we have total reflection, no reflection. I can tint that reflection. So if I make it a bit red, pretty subtle, but the color of this reflection will be pretty warm. Whereas if I make it blue, it's going to be much cooler. Now, if I take my IOR and say, make it really shiny, maybe even one, and then I take the base color and set it to black, you could think of this as basically being pure reflection. In fact, if I get rid of the reflection, pure black. And now we can get to some of these sliders. Metallic is basically how much the surface responds as a metal. This is the kind of thing that plays really well, by the way, with this uh, tinting. So if I set this to red, and now you can see it's a red metal. If I'm going for like a copperish, of course, we'd make it look a little bit orange. Uh, but this is like an easy way to make a copper material. Additionally, now that we have a purely reflective material, there is a quality of that reflection. Is that reflection kind of like frosted glass or is it like a perfect mirror? That is what this roughness does. So if I take it all the way down, you can see it's getting kind of like super. I mean, it's not getting any shinier, but it's getting sharper, the reflections. And you can actually see kind of the room reflecting off of it. Whereas when it's very rough, that reflection exists, but it's kind of like scattered out like this. So so for a fabric, this might be very high, whereas for a mirror, it would be like very close to zero. All these like inconsistencies in the reflection come from the actual mesh model. Next order of business, we have IOR, which seems pretty familiar because we have this IOR level for our specular, but this one is very different. It affects basically everything. More specifically, when light kind of interacts with an object, so let's say there's a light ray coming in here, if it's transmissive, like glass, it could just keep going in the same direction, but more likely than not, the angle is going to change a bit. It like bends light. The amount that it does that is the index of refraction. Now, it turns out that IOR also has an influence on reflection, not just like transmission. So if the light bounces off the object, there could be a, a tiny kind of like nudge and angle. So for example, water has an IOR of 1.33, kind of the highest it ever goes is four. And now you can see it's looking like super metallic. So amber has an IOR of 1.5, glass has 1.5, gold has a very low one at 0.47. For gold, I'd set this 2.47. I'd make the base color kind of like a kind of yellowish goldenish. I'd make sure that we have full reflectance, full metallic, and I'd make sure that the gold kind of looks gold. Okay, next up we have alpha. Alpha is not transmission, but it's actually transparency. So you can see as I bring it down, it's as if I put a layer in Photoshop and then I said lower the opacity. You know, this isn't physically accurate. Things don't just disappear. Okay, next up, we have the normal socket. What you need to know is that an object for every single face has a normal direction. This is basically the vector or the direction that points outward. Almost like if this object was a porcupine, where would the needles point out? So this is the normal, then it kind of curves this way. Now it's facing up, whereas over here it goes this way. The normals are important because that is how Blender knows how to shade and kind of like treat lighting for an object. Object. So if I was to use a noise texture, this isn't going to look great, but if I plug it in here, you can see all of a sudden the normals are acting weirdly, like it still works with other things in the material. I can add something like a bump node. This is a classic trick. It changes a height field or a noise texture into normal information. As I bring up the scale, this is a good way to make like leather or something just to really show there's some like surface detail going on. Now we come to a fun one and it's new to 4.3, I think. And this is the diffuse roughness slider. So just like we have a roughness for specular, so too for diffuse. So I'm going to get rid of all our reflection. So it's going to be black and then let's add in a bit of diffuse. The roughness is basically going to dictate how should diffuse be calculated. So if I increase this all the way, it's going to act kind of differently on the edges. So this is the before, and then this is the after. What you need to know is it's shading it differently, and you can think of roughness zero as what the principal BSDF used to be, whereas as we increase the roughness closer to one, it calculates something called like an aura nayer. What it really does is it mimics the diffuse BSDF a bit better. So this by default kind of has this like roughness slider. So let me just kind of compare these. So I'm going to bring the roughness all the way up, and then you can basically not tell the difference. This is good because if you have a truly rough surface, like I guess gravel or sand or something, you want to bring this all the way up, I believe, to get rid of some of that weird curvature and make it look more flat shaded. You can think of subsurface as basically light leaking through things. So the flashlight on the hand, you know, your flesh is kind of red. And usually these things are red because we think of them as like flesh or candle or whatever. But all kinds of materials have visible subsurface, like ice, like an icicle kind of has this bluish subsurface. So the weight of this is basically saying, do I have subsurface or not? It's not the quality of it. It's just saying, do we have it? So I'm going to bring it up to one and you can see all the sudden it definitely calculated something and it's starting to look a bit more milky smooth. The most important setting right here is the scale. And it's saying like how deep can the light ray penetrate? So if I set this to like a huge number like two, you can see all of a sudden it kind of looks like wax. And you can think of this as a light ray comes through the surface, but to get all the way to the other side, it has to travel a big distance. And as you might expect, the thinnest parts of the geometry where there's like only like a little bit of depth or thickness, we're going to see it the most. You can see that this scale isn't arbitrary. It has a unit. So in this case, meters, I could type in two feet and it will calculate that in meters. It actually cares about 
at the scale of what it is you're typing in. What that basically means is you've got to make sure you've applied scale. So if these numbers don't say one, subsurface is not going to calculate correctly. And to fix that, hit control A, apply scale. A couple other things about subsurface. The radius is kind of like a fancy way to talk about the color. So this is literally red, green, and blue. Let's make it nice and red. And now you can see the subsurface is kind of going through with this reddish kind of color. I can make the subsurface green. I can make it blue. And this is dependent on your surface properties, I guess. Finally, we have something called anisotropy. You're not going to really see it in subsurface, but as you increase it, what it's supposed to do is this light leak is supposed to kind of face the direction of your light source. Easier to see in the metallic thing. I'm going to increase this all the way up, and you can see it kind of changed the way this looks. So before, it just kind of has a reflection, whereas after, it's kind of following the contours of the surface. And again, what's happening here is it's stretching towards the light source. This is kind of the bottom of the pan effect you get with metals. Additionally, you can then take it and say, stretch towards the light, or maybe you can rotate that, and you can get different kinds of uh, directions here. And then similar to normal coordinates, you can actually change the tangent, which basically tells you not really which way the surface is facing, but which way is kind of like hugging it, in a sense. And by default, it just uses tangents, I believe. But you can start doing weird things where you say it's defined by the UV map and stuff like that. This tutorial, Dripping, actually oozing with prestige, is sponsored by Squarespace, which is, indeed, the place that you should be making a website. There are three reasons you should consider using it. The first one is it's just kind of easy to set up, whether you're just dragging around blocks or just injecting HTML, which is what I do. You can actually have apps assets inside of your like Squarespace profile. And if you want to get fancy, you can actually format or actually write content with AI assistance nowadays. You can just prompt and it will generate stuff or you can design your website. And the third reason that I definitely use it is because they have a integrated payment system. So I have a sponsorship kind of tier, kind of like Patreon on my website. Do I want to build that thing myself? No, they accept every payment under the sun. So you can head over to Squarespace, you know, make a website. And when you're ready to take that live, you can use this link that's in the description to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And now the master of BSDF is going to return. Next up, and this is the thing that lets you make not like transparent, but any transmissive surface like glass, like honey, all kinds of liquids. As I bring this up, you're going to start seeing through it until I go all the way up. And now you can see it's very kind of glassy. The important thing about transmissive materials is the main thing that is going to change the look of them is this roughness slider. So as I bring this up, it's going to be more of a frosted glass, whereas as I bring it down, it's more of a traditional glass that you can see right through. And like I said, this base color also plays nice with the transmission. So here we have kind of like a honey like material. And I guess one more thing thing to note is this IOR. This heavily, heavily, heavily affects kind of this transmission. Value of one is basically the IOR, index of refraction of air. It means you can see right through it. Just like when you look anywhere, you know there's air, but you just see right through it. As you increase it, it's going to refract or bend light more. So, so far, everything we've been doing, you can think of it as we're talking about material properties, and that's what we see. But coat is almost like we're putting a additional layer on top of it. Just like the others, the weight is just the quantity. Is it there or is it not? It's not the quality of the coat. As I increase this, especially if I make it darker so we can see, it's it's going to add kind of this like reflective layer on top. And this is how you make car paint. Like there's this shiny surface, kind of like a saran wrap, plastic wrap kind of look to it, which in itself has a roughness slider that can go in either direction. So without coat, with coat, and just like the other one, you have a index of refraction where if it's equal to one, you basically see right through it. But remember, specular is basically like your base layer of the material, whereas coat sits on top of that. And just like the specular had a color, so too can the tint be a different color. And now since the coat is everywhere, it's going to tint the thing everywhere. And just like we had a normal socket, so too do we have one specifically for the thin layer of coat. And now you can see we've changed the quality of the surface coating. Okay, one of my favorite ones is sheen. And conveniently, sheen is used for fabrics a lot of the time. And since this is a fabric, we can get a good demo. And the thing to know about fabrics is there's almost like this additive effect as you look kind of in these like edge regions over here. You're going to see already it's kind of getting a bit brighter. Sheen basically takes that and amps it up a lot. So again, weight slider, is it there or is it not? So it adds this kind of like fabric-y, or you can also use it for dust. It accumulates and it makes the surface brighter. Roughness, as you set it to zero, it may as well not be there, even if we have full strength. And then as you increase the roughness, it's more and more there and more and more scattered. I can also tint the color of this. So let's make it also kind of like a reddish, maybe a bit brighter. And now we have the material of a kind of like a fancy cushion. So that's what Sheen does. It makes it look like fabric. Emission, you've probably seen it. It makes the surface glow. It literally emits light. So if I make this green and then the strength I set to one, all of a sudden you can see it glows. You're going to see it's actually emitting light on the surface of this, which the uh, color can be changed for. So if you make a light bulb or something like that, and you've actually modeled the filament, you can have the filament itself emit light. The thing to know about this is it's super computationally expensive and tends to be like super slow compared to just adding one of Blender's default lights. And then finally, we have thin film. This is a weird one and a newish addition. You could think of thin film as something very similar to coating. It sits on top of our material. And in this case, we use it to describe like soap bubbles, maybe like oil. It's that iridescent effect that you get, especially within surfaces. Just going to make this a bright white. I'm also going to make it fully transmissive and pretty 
see through. So I'm trying to basically approximate the kind of like the bubble looking thing, which means the IOR should be close to one. And this is kind of like a good base for a bubble material. But you see it has none of that iridescence. You don't see the curvature. This is what thin film is for. And you're going to see this is the only other value that has kind of like a unit. So remember, subsurface had a scale that was physically accurate. So the scale matters, so too with thin film. Although this time it's not in meters, it's in nanometers, or as I like to say, nanometers. <laughs> this is, again, something you can look up a chart or a graph of. It seems like bubbles kind of exist somewhere around like 700. And you can see immediately when I type that in, we get this bubble-ish thing. You can play with the IOR of that, which if you bring it too high, acts kind of weird. But this kind of shifts through the colors of the spectrum. You can think of this as the thickness or the thinness of a bubble. It's super, super tiny, which is why we're going with nanometers. So it can sit on top of a black material. And now you can see we have this nice iridescence, almost like we spilled some oil on it. Okay, that's my introduction to you for the principle of BSDF. Hopefully you understand it better. You can get the model in the places that I said you can, and uh, see ya.